one Smith Corona laptop word processor, one trim line telephone, three locks on the door, dark shades, some up, some down, but never halfway, one round table in the dining room, one of those architects kneel sit drafting chairs, one desk of the plain metal office stock variety, one Picasso print, barely holding on for the amount of dart holes in it, an enlarged photograph of the inside of a wave breaking over the head of the photographer. Yes, Herman took the picture. A wave so clear the sun is visible through the liquid roof of the wave's curling lip. One strapless Timex watch taped to the wall as a clock for superheroes with good eyesight. One bed made out of two by fours and plywood with a thin mattress on top. One standard halogen lamp, one old bureau, one antique roll top desk from his mom, one eight foot bookcase with all the best American books, with all the best American books of the 20th century. <clears throat> paper of all kinds everywhere, newspaper, typing paper, drawing paper, rolling paper, one closet full of old shoes, one suit for the interviews his father thought he was going to have. No underwear, no, un no underwear, no handkerchiefs, 10 pairs of socks, soccer shorts and t-shirts, mostly plain ones, a, a pile of jeans appropriately varied in age, but all, but all more or less faded. No, excuse me, no sports equipment besides a heavyweight frisbee, one hand-built six-speed racing bike with drop bars and razor-thin tubeless tires, no mirrors, no pets, no plants except for two medium-sized cacti on one of the windowsills, one huge dictionary, no thesaurus that I could find. One coat rack by the door, no hats, no umbrellas. One heavy wool coat, one huge pile of magazines and a blue recycling bin. No alarm clock besides a window near his bed with the, shake up, with the shade up. The water filter on his kitchen tap, no calendar. One set of keys, probably on him. One pair of Revo sunglasses that he won in a bet. One box of Legos for when his nephews visit and occasionally for the rest of us. <clears throat> Unscented deodorant, baby shampoo, one chessboard, and one metal Vornado chess, excuse me, one metal Vornado desk fan from the Mickey Spillane era. And I doubt Herman took all this stuff to Colorado with him, but nevertheless, the only reason he wouldn't bring it is because he's memorized the maps and he's read all the books. Oh, and his stereo, a brilliant mismatch, mishmash, he bought a $500 receiver and a $400 set of speakers when he was 15, with all the money he earned from being just about the most charming shithead in the neighborhood. There wasn't an old person within a mile who didn't love to have him cut the grass or do some job or another. The only people who paid me to do chores were my parents, but that's because they're smart. They knew I wasn't about to spend my only Saturday cleaning the house that they didn't pay up for it. Oh yeah, and his CDs. Only a hundred or so, but all very carefully chosen. You can bet on that. There are plenty of things I know I'm going to forget to mention about Herman, especially some of the some of the stuff that went on when we were kids. Especially some of the stuff that went on when we were kids. But I'm not going to kill myself about it. I'm not going to kill myself about it. So just bear with me while I mention some, and mention some things randomly that you'll have to take at face value. When we were six or seven, his dad built a custom Lotus sports car in their garage. And Herman spent just about every waking afternoon there for two years checking out the progress his dad, was made, his dad made the night before. When we were nine, he put together a clubhouse up in, up, up in the rafters of his garage. Herman made up strict rules about not wearing shoes and rules for total silence when he wanted to meditate. I don't think he actually knew what meditating was, but he sure pretended about it pretty well. He sure pretended about it pretty well. He'd fold his legs all up close. He, he, excuse me, he'd fold his legs all up and close his eyes with his back perfectly straight. If any of us made a noise, he'd tell us to leave. And when he told us to leave, we usually did. <clears throat> when he was 13, he disappeared from home for four days. When I found him, he told me he'd been sleeping on the heating grates downtown with a bunch of homeless guys near the Yale, near the, near the Yale Rare Book Library. The coal, the, the, excuse me, the, near the Yale Rare Book Library. The cool, translucent marble 
the cool translucent marble one near Woolsey Hall downtown. When we were 12, we were throwing horse chestnuts out into a busy road so the cars would run over them with their tires. By accident, I hit one car in the passenger side window, which was open, and the guy driving skidded to a stop, jumped out, then sprinted across the church parking lot to our duck blind in the bushes. By the time he was out of his car, we were safely behind tree cover, behind thick tree cover. The guy got to within 60 feet of us, but he couldn't see us in the trees. So Herman, what does he do? He tells me to get ready to run, winds up, picks a thin red line through the branches of the pine trees, and lets go of a chestnut that takes our angry driver right between the hairline and the eyebrows. The guy, the guy let out a comical yelp followed by, Jesus, fuck, shit, and then, started, and then started at us towards the trees. But by that time, we were already on the far sidewalk of the street behind us and moving to safety at a good clip. On the subject of projectiles, between the ages of 7 and 17, Herman successfully hit cars with snowballs about five or six hundred times, about five or six hundred more times than I did, and I made more attempts. When Herman was, when Herman was 12, he learned to balance things on his nose. That's how he won those Revo sunglasses. Some preppy kid at the high school tennis courts bet him that he couldn't keep a racket up in his nose for a full minute. Just to prove another point and to embarrass the guy, he kept it up for five minutes. The, girl's, the guy's girlfriend laughed at him and made him give Herman the Revos. The guy almost pissed himself. When we were 16, Herman learned how to shoot bottle caps and pennies by snapping his finger. He was leaving a room at school once when we were, when we were all where we were all hanging out, and there were three soda cans on the windowsill behind us. From 10 or 12 feet, he hit, he said, from, from 10 or 12 feet, he said, the middle one, the middle one, and then blasted the middle Mountain Dew can onto the floor with a bottle, with a bottle cap. In college, he did the exact same thing with the middle, with the middle beer bottle. He'd had at least four or five beers like the rest of us, like the rest of us, and again he said, the middle one, and then dinged it. That night, the other guys, the peanut gallery, gave him the neat, gave him, <clears throat> that night, the other guys, the peanut gallery, gave him the name, gave him the nickname, Herman America. The night over Christmas vacation, when we were still 14, when he hooked up with a sexy, popular girl I mentioned from our high school, we were supposed to get a ride home from the dance with my dad, who was waiting outside parked in the snow. Well, Herman walked over to this girl, this young woman, she was at the ripe age of 17, and he asked her to dance. The next thing I know, the next thing I knew, they were leaving together, and he stopped to tell me that he didn't need a ride. My dad was pretty impressed when I told him Herman was with a girl three years older than him. My dad said, doesn't she have friends Herman could set you up with, David? Uh, my dad always seemed to give Herman a little more respect, a little more respect after that night, and I hated him for it, both of them. When Herman was just 10 and I was almost 11, we were playing wiffle ball in the backyard and some teenager in the schoolyard and some teenagers came in and took our bat and ball and started a game of their own. Well, what did Herman do? He went right up to the piece of shit 17-year-old at home plate and managed to get in the way of the kid's swing. The bat hit Herman in the side of the head. The older the bat hit Herman in the side of the head. The older kid turned to see what he hit, as if he didn't know, and just and just when he was facing Herman, Herman snatched the bat from him and smashed him in the face with it. In a blur of furious motion. In a blur of furious motion. Now granted, it was only a wiffle bat, but all that means is that the kid got a black eye and a bloody nose instead of dying right there in the spot from the crushed faceplate and internal hemorrhaging. I told you, Herman never hit that much, but when he did, it was always somebody bigger than him, and it was always, and it was always totally wicked. Most of the time, it was Herman's tongue that pissed people off. One time, one time when we were still in middle school, this huge kid, Dickie, who was in our grade but a lot older on account of staying back so many times, came up to us on the sidewalk after the bell and said he was going to beat Herman up and make him cry. But immediately Herman spoke up and said something like, 
I'm not really into fighting, but I wouldn't be against having a spelling contest with you, Mr. Dickey. That's just the way it sounded. Always long and drawn out, so the suspense killed you while you stood there listening to Herman speak in a full sentence. Well, the end of that story is that Herman and I could both run faster than Dickey could. So we did. And if anger is any measure on how fast a person can run, you'd think that Dickey could have caught us. You'd think that Dickey would have caught us. When I was 15, I punched Herman for the last time. He said something about how I, how I had a short temper and couldn't control myself. So I answered, him, I answered him the way I always did when he was pissing me off. I didn't hit him in the face, though. I hit him in the face since I hadn't hit him in the face since I was like 12 or something. I just hit him in the stomach where I knew I could double him over and make him lose his breath. Well, when he got up that time, he looked at me dead straight in the eyes. All he did was look at me, but it was a new look, hitherto unfamiliar to me. <coughs> hitherto unfamiliar to me. It was a look that, state, that stated clearly and efficiently that I would never hit him again. It was as if he was shaking his head side to side, but he wasn't. He was just looking. He was just looking. And you don't often think of blue eyes as all that threatening. But all of a sudden it was clear to me that I didn't ever want to make him mad again. I think part of it was that I'd gotten so used to seeing him take things in stride, you know, act cool under pressure. The idea of him actually getting really mad was almost too terrifying to think about. I wasn't thinking that he might, that he might get the jump on me. I was thinking I could probably get along just fine without giving him additional reasons to psychoanalyze me. When we were really young, when we were really young, I never hesitated to pound on Herman when he was being a jerk. He was smaller and he talked a lot, so it was his job really to get pounded on by people he was pissing off. Anyway, things changed over the years. All of a sudden, when we were 14, he started going down with his best looking he started going out with the best looking, coolest girl in the school, and I was nothing but a sidekick. Let me read that again. All of a sudden, when we were 14, he started going out with the best looking, coolest girl in the school, coolest girl in the school, and I was nothing but his sidekick. All of a sudden, he was a 14 year old who had a girlfriend with a new Volvo who drove him everywhere. All of a sudden, when we started high school, he was a starter on the varsity soccer team while I was playing JV football and sitting on the bench. All of a sudden, he was just about as tall as me and working out almost obsessively. All of a sudden, at 14, he got this look in his face that said, nobody's going to hit me and nobody's going to tell me what to do. And that, and that may sound, and that, excuse me, and that may not sound very strange for a teenage guy, for a teenage guy, but the thing that was different with Herman was that everyone pretty much felt the same way about him as he did about himself. It was like having the cockiest kid in the world as your best friend and having everyone in the world tell you that he deserved to be cocky. Likewise, it was like having everyone say your best friend is really damn charming. And well, you're just not quite so much. <laughs>